demonstrators arrived in their thousands for what they call the mother of all protests. Hemos sufrido el octavo ataque por grupos terroristas. Loud tear gas, protesters throwing stones. Son ya nueve las personas que han perdido la vida en medio de las marchas. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. Here are some of the media developments we're covering this week. Venezuela, one of those stories where politics, economics, and the coverage collide. Now you see it, now you don't. Israel's state-owned broadcaster comes to a sudden, undignified end. A look back at the days when Cuban movie theaters delivered the news. And South Korean news broadcasters take political animations to a whole new level. For much of the last month, the Venezuelan streets have been awash with demonstrators. The economy there shows signs of collapsing. Inflation is at a record high. Many are going hungry, lacking access to the basics like clean water and medicine. With almost 40 protesters killed, a lot of the news coverage comes down to the laying of blame. The official government narrative goes that right-wing news media are trying to force a foreign intervention, while demonstrators are accusing the president, Nicolas Maduro, of trying to subvert democracy by suppressing the media. Maduro's predecessor, Hugo Chavez, spent much of his presidency at war with conservative news outlets in Venezuela. He blamed some of them for backing an attempted coup against him in 2002, which they did on the air. Chavez made changes on the broadcast side, both regulatory and related to ownership. Maduro has continued that trend with print outlets. But even formerly friendly voices in the news media are starting to turn on the Maduro government. More and more journalists say they cannot report freely for mainstream news outlets and have ended up online using new platforms like the messaging app Telegram to get the story out. However, the emergence of something like 300 new digital news sources over the past few years has done little to bridge the political gap. It turns out that Venezuelans are just as divided online as they are on the streets. Our starting point this week is the capital, Caracas. De manera que los medios están construyendo a la desinformación, a la polarización y a la radicalización. Estos planes de violencia, estos planes desestabilizadores. Somos más que victimarios, somos víctimas de esta situación. Medios y periodistas. Continúa el lanzamiento de gas lacrimógeno por doquier. Con Chávez esta convivencia y enfrentamiento y con Maduro vino la aplicación de la hegemonía comunicacional. Yo pido apoyo también a ustedes en esta batalla comunicacional. Y el impacto es la desinformación que hay en Venezuela. That information void really hits home when Venezuelans turn to their televisions in search of news. The nationwide demonstration started in March when the National Assembly was shut down by the Supreme Court, which was followed by opposition calls for fresh elections. The six weeks of marches and street clashes since have attracted a certain kind of news coverage in the mainstream media. Selective and one sided. 15 days after the protest broke out, we started monitoring the three main television channels Televen, Venevision, and Globovision. We found some similar characteristics in the coverage. The channels gave more airtime to government spokespeople criticizing the demonstrations than to voices from the opposition. And when they were covering a government-organized march, they gave airtime to government spokespeople and to the people marching. The opposition media can only see pro-Maduro activists as being in the government service, perverting the protests. And pro-government media are only able to see protesters wearing their hoodies, working for the opposition. I take refuge in the media and networks that are describing the country I want to be living. And I never really look at the information from the other side. So the media is contributing to the disinformation, the polarization and the radicalization. It is not possible to examine the Venezuelan media in 2017 without referring to the attempted coup of 2002. Back then, the bulk of the private media was owned by businessmen hostile to President Hugo Chavez's socialist Bolivarian agenda. 
TV channels like RCTV, Venevision, and Globovision urged coup backers onto the streets. And when Chavez was temporarily deposed, the politicians behind the coup went onto those channels, Gracias, thanking them for their support. When Chavez was restored to power, he began to reshape Venezuela's broadcast landscape. After Nicolas Maduro took over in 2013, upon Chavez's death, the changes continued, newspapers included. They bought Globovision, they bought Ultimas Noticias, they bought El Universal. They bought the two most important newspapers in the country. I'm not saying the government bought them, it was people very close to the government. I have personal experience of all this. I worked at Ultimas Noticias and the paper was sold to a businessman whose identity remains unknown to this day. The editorial lines changed drastically. The president of the National Assembly was Diosdado Cabello. And because of some uncomfortable questions that I asked and articles that I published, Diosdado called the president of Ultimas Noticias, Hector de Villa, and told him to fire me. Hector de Villa me despidió. Censura estatal. State censorship as such doesn't exist. Why doesn't it exist? Because the government has good media support from radio, printed media and social media that defend the government agenda. What does indeed exist is self-censorship. That self-censorship is now showing signs of cracking. Global Vision was an openly anti-government channel until 2013, when it was sold to Juan Domingo Cordero, an insurance tycoon close to the government. Then it announced a change to its editorial line, moving to what it called the center. People like Vladimir Villegas, leftist voices, were hired by Globovision, but even they have grown critical of a government they had long defended. Yo lo invito a la reflexión, señor presidente. Esa práctica de ver en cada protesta o en cada reclamo una conspiración no lleva a nada bueno. Villegas and the channel must watch their words. The Minister of Information, who happens to be Villegas's brother Ernesto, has delayed the renewal of Global Vision's license. If they push it too far, the channel could be off the air. El canal. Global Vision is trying to get a diversity of opinions. Before, the channel was a political party with a camera. But now, if you compare us against the old Global Vision, you will find a big difference. Our dilemma, however, is this. Do we keep this space, or do we adopt a heroic posture and get shut down when this window gets closed? Venezuela's is the kind of media climate that spawns alternative news sources online video streaming channels like VivoPlay and VPI TV, news sites like Runurunes and El Pitazo. Having been fired from Ultimas Noticias, Odell Lopez now runs SPI, a news service that sorts rumors and fiction from fact. Given Venezuela's painfully slow internet speeds, among the worst in the Americas, SPI relies on mobile phone apps like Telegram and WhatsApp to spread its work. Venezuela. This tumultuous Venezuelan society generates information every minute, day and night. And when there aren't any media outlets that really inform you about what you need to know, this results in misinformation through rumors. In a poor household in Venezuela, they may not have internet, but they probably have a smartphone with WhatsApp through which they can receive voice messages with the information that we disseminate every moment. The new alternative outlets live stream demonstrations the mainstream media gloss over and, when the story warrants, dispute the state-owned channel's version of events. In April, a protester named Juan Pernalete was killed. Eyewitnesses said he was struck by a tear gas canister fired from behind police lines. The men helping Pernalete soon found themselves on the state-owned VTV. What does VTV do? It created a whole story in which those young men left him there because it was them who had hurt him. They do this. They create a whole conspiracy theory in which they tell lie after lie to create amazing stories. 
This is why on Friday the 5th of May, both Ronrunes and El Pitavo published two features about the case. Ronrunes published leaked information from the CICPC, the Crime Investigation Bureau, where an expert in ballistics provided information that it was in fact a tear gas bomb that killed Pernalete. But online journalism is not beyond the reach of the authorities. Last month, both VivoPlay and VPI TV were blocked by their internet providers. The net is the latest front in a Venezuelan media war that broke out 15 years ago. For news consumers, there is no end and not nearly enough of the truth in sight. Other media stories that are on our radar this week. The White House wanted to mark Donald Trump's first 100 days in office by putting out a TV ad befitting the occasion. But when news outlets decided it was unfit for broadcast, Americans had more accusations of fake news to deal with. Donald Trump, sworn in as president 100 days ago. Four major broadcasters, ABC, CBS, NBC, and CNN, refused to run the 30-second ad, which purported to tell the truth mainstream media refuses to tell, listing anchors such as MSNBC's Rachel Maddow and CNN's Wolf Blitzer as merchants of fake news. The Trump camp then went on Fox News to defend the ad and called the refusal to broadcast it censorship. This is supposed to be a free society. We have freedom of speech. But CNN explained it this way, that it had requested that the advertiser remove the false graphic, that the mainstream media is fake news. The mainstream media is not fake news, and therefore the ad is false, and per policy will be accepted only if that graphic is deleted. Six days after Trump moved into the White House, the West African country of Gambia also got a new president, Adama Barrow. Journalists there will have carefully noted some of the positive statements the new government is making about the importance of press freedom, just in case those quotes come in handy someday. Barrow's information minister, Demba Ali Jawo, chose World Press Freedom Day to talk about reconciliation in the country, promising justice for our colleagues who were victims during the former regime, who include the late Deda Hidara, Chief Mane, and Omar Barrow, and all the journalists who were subjected to torture. Under the former president, Yaya Jame, who was in power for 23 years, Gambian journalists lived in fear. Broadcast media was strictly controlled, and social networks could not be accessed without the use of a VPN. The new government is also talking about allowing privately owned television channels on the air to break the state monopoly. The shift in policy was quickly backed by the Gambia Press Union, as well as the Paris-based Reporters Without Borders, which urged the new government to embark quickly with legislative action reflecting the promised changes. The long-standing political battle between Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the state-owned broadcaster IBA has finally come to an end. And with IBA now off the air, Netanyahu would appear to have won. The IBA had been a fixture on the Israeli airwaves for 69 years, growing to include two television channels and eight radio stations until effectively going to black May 10th. It will be replaced by the new Israel Public Broadcasting Corporation, Khan, which is scheduled to begin broadcasting Monday, May 15th. Khan, as currently configured, will have no news division. Netanyahu says the changes were a necessary reorganization, but his critics say that he is clamping down on critical voices. The decision to shut down IBA was made public before workers there had been notified. <laughs> About 500 employees will be transferred to the new broadcaster, but more than 600 could end up losing their jobs. A skeleton staff did remain at IBA, about 20 people, to make sure that the channel's final broadcast makes air. And how is IBA going out? What will be its last ever broadcast? The Eurovision Song Contest. Israelis love it. Oftentimes here at the Listening Post, we chronicle the shifts in news consumption that have taken place over the years, from television to computers to laptops to smartphones. This week, we want to scroll back even further in time to when news was delivered on the silver screen in cinemas. Newsreels were common in many countries until the 1960s, when TV made them obsolete, unless you were in Cuba. Between 1960 and 1990, the country's Film Institute produced a weekly news program it called El Noticiero Icaic. 
It would be shown before film screenings in the capital, Havana, and around the island. During those 30 years, the news bulletin covered history both local and global. The Cuban Missile Crisis, the Bay of Pigs invasion, coups around Latin America, the Vietnam War, independence wars in Africa, leaving a celluloid record of major events viewed through Cuban eyes. In all, there were 1,493 newscasts produced, many of which could be dismissed as outright propaganda, but which pushed the limits of news, of visual storytelling, and have left a legacy that we think is worth a revisit. So the Listening Post went to Cuba, and we talked to one of the producers behind the newscasts, Manuel Perez Paredes. Cinema newsreels are anachronisms now, but back then, Cubans were covering the news their way, and we haven't seen anything like what they produced since. La historia comienza aquí. En este... ¿Por qué surge el noticiero? ¿Por qué surge un noticiero de cine? Eh, los cines en Cuba. Yo creo que para entenderlo hay que situarse en la época. En la época, en la Cuba de 1960, mes de junio. La revolución lleva en el poder año y medio. Y ya se está desarrollando una confrontación, llamémosle de clase, muy fuerte, entre los que apoyan a la revolución y los que comienzan a estar en contra o están abiertamente en contra. Y vamos a añadir que en el medio hay una capa de la población indecisa, eh, no sabe muy bien qué hacer, dada la dinámica, la velocidad con la que se daban los acontecimientos al interior del país en la relación de Cuba con los Estados Unidos, por supuesto. Esa confrontación se daba en la calle, en todo el país, y por lo tanto se daba en los cines. En los cines comienza a darse una confrontación de clase. Cuando aparece Fidel, por ejemplo, que es un noticiero privado, en la pantalla, el público que está en contra de la revolución, que discrepa de la revolución, puede silbar, chiflar o emitir algún grito contra Fidel o contra el Che Guevara o contra cualquier representación de la revolución. Y el que, y el que es revolucionario en el cine contesta el silbido con un aplauso. O sea, comienza a darse en los cines una confrontación eh, política que a veces llega a ser física acompañada de la oscuridad y podía darse el caso que se aplaudiera la imagen de Fidel, terminaba el noticiero, empezaba una película norteamericana, aparecía el león de la metro Golden Mayer y el público aplaudía el león de la metro. En ese clima la dirección del ICAI considera que debe haber un punto de vista del cine cubano en las pantallas de los cines de este país y decide hacer un noticiero ICAI. empieza en el año 60, si tú ves los noticieros de la época, te vas, a, te vas a dar cuenta que el texto de la redacción de lo que va a decir el narrador y la forma en que el narrador lo dice es enfática, es militante. El comandante Fidel Castro explica la posición de Cuba respecto a los armamentos. Hay momentos de la confrontación donde se van los matices al diablo, ¿no? Es una confrontación a muerte la que se va dando en Cuba. Pocos meses después se da la invasión de Playa Girón. La rápida movilización del pueblo armado y sus golpes sin tregua frenan el ataque enemigo y tienden un cerco de fuego a su alrededor. El noticiero llegaba y se lanzaba, eh, como decimos nosotros, una expresión cubana de barriga, sin miedo, a defender las posiciones revolucionarias y al mismo tiempo a ser marcadamente antiimperialista. En pie de guerra, serenamente, el pueblo espera para recibir con hierro y fuego a los que osen hollar nuestro suelo. Patria o muerte, venceremos. Amanecer de un día de septiembre de 1973, zona liberada de Vietnam del Sur, territorio libre vietnamita. La heroica tierra del sur recibe por primera vez la visita de un jefe de estado, Fidel. Ya a la altura de 1962... 63, se comienza a ver que el noticiero 
no es solamente un resumen semanal cinematográfico, ágil, movido, militante, sino también que hay elaboración artística. Comienza a darse noticiero donde tú sientes creatividad, imaginación. Comienzan a combinar muy bien la militancia política con la irreverencia, con, con la transgresión. O sea, no es una militancia política ortodoxa en el lenguaje. Es, es capaz de, de violar ciertos reglamentos de cómo decir las cosas. Recuerdo uno que es terminar el noticiero con un discurso de Fidel que está llamando al esfuerzo máximo para, una, para un momento bien importante en la economía de este país, que era hacer o no la zafra de los 10 millones. Bien, Fidel está haciendo una exhortación a la necesidad de trabajar organizadamente, fuertemente, coherentemente. Y con confianza libraremos esta batalla final. Y mientras Fidel está hablando y haciendo ese llamado a la población, se comienza a introducir por debajo de nuestro pueblo de Fidel ellos de los Beatles hay que pensar que el país se está defendiendo culturalmente y que expresiones musicales no nacionales digamos y, y sobre todo habladas en inglés no serían lo más aconsejable lo que el buen proceder de lo políticamente correcto, diría, no uses a los Beatles, usa a lo mejor música cubana. Ahora, hubo momentos, noticieros críticos, con aspectos de la realidad. ¿Quién tiene en sus manos resolver esto? Bueno, en sus manos tiene que resolver en este caso el organismo, el ministerio nuestro que hay que nos dirige. Donde había tendencias corrientes dentro del, del gobierno que podían estar en desacuerdo con un noticiero. Tú podías en todo caso como espectador del noticiero, inferir, reflexionar de que algunos de los problemas, ya tú como espectador, espectadora, re, estaban expresando problemas estructurales. Esto es, eh, la vinculación aquí es colectiva. Antiguamente, si era individual, se ganaba más y todo el mundo cogía. Es, más, es, es mucho mejor, es mejor la, la vinculación individual. Yo creo que ya en los finales de los 80, principios de los 90, el país entraba en un periodo crítico de tipo económico, muy fuerte, muy fuerte. Realmente las posibilidades de seguir haciendo el noticiero en términos materiales, en términos de costo, comenzaba a ser inviable. Yo creo que esa comenzaba a ser una tarea que no se ha cumplido, por supuesto, hoy en día, de la televisión nuestra. Pelicay fijó una posición ante la cultura artística que supone riesgos, supone la posibilidad de equivocarte, pero que sin embargo hay que correrla. Finally, come election night, how do you decide which channel's coverage to watch? Do you look for the most up-to-date results, the most objective reporting, the most accurate analysis? Or do you want to see the candidates turned into animations, flying like superheroes, bouncing like Pokemon characters, or riding on the back of a dragon like Game of Thrones? Because in South Korea, that is an option. From what we saw of last week's coverage of election night in the presidential race there, the creative team at SBS, a news channel, have some pretty active imaginations. We'll leave you now with a selection of some of the ways they tracked the horse race. And we'll see you next time here at the Listening Post.